And cool. So uh, how you been? Doing well. Thank you uh, for having me on the show. I know maybe for the listeners, they don't know it's late. So thank you for accommodating on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. I'm excited to talk with you. Um, I've seen, you know, a little bit of your stuff floating around the uh, the internet. You know, I've seen some of uh, your Wednesday reviews. Um, and I really like your style. I think it's like really like down to earth and stuff. It um, You relate very well to like, uh, you know, a lot of the people in the community. So I was excited to even get the opportunity to talk to you. And then you also have um, this Kickstarter going on. So um, I guess, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell everybody where they can find you and what you do. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate it. And like you said, I, I do Wednesday comic reviews on, on my YouTube channel, Comic Uno, uh, mostly known for that. And then I'm also a comic book journalist for Newsrama. I also work for DC Comics, DC Universe, have bylines with IGN fandoms. I've, I've been in the uh, comic book journalism sphere for a while. And uh, now I also have my life follow my daughter Kickstarter. We're up to issue seven on this one. So I've done Kickstarters before, of course, but really happy to see how well this one's doing and uh, to spread the word. We have 22 days left on it. Uh, it's about a high school girl. Father left her, become a full time superhero. Everyone in the world loves him except for her. And then she inherits his abilities. So there's a lot more drama that happens in the book as we get to issue seven. Uh, but that is the log line for, for the series. Awesome. Um, yeah, I was looking through it and, uh, I thought it looked really, it looks really interesting. It looks really cool. It's got, uh, it kind of reminds me of some of the stuff that like Marvel's trying to do with their, uh, almost like teen line, I guess, you know, uh, kind of like unbeatable squirrel girl. My daughter has, um, a couple of comics that has like Miles Morales and squirrel girl and Kamala in them, you know? And so the, at least the art style looking through the Kickstarter kind of reminds me of that, but, uh, you know, what are your influences? What are you going for here? Uh, so I think you hit the nail on the head on, I would say a Marvel and DC vibe though. Um, it, I, I think the the, the title kind of explains it all. It's a superhero drama. So yes, it's a superhero book. We deal with superhero stuff, but it, it really at the heart is about these characters. It, you know, the superhero stuff actually kind of goes to the side uh, and it's more about how being a superhero affects others and, and affects the interpersonal relationships. So that's kind of what the book's kind of aiming for, which I, I think the teen books, I think any superhero book does do, but really relies a bit more on the action and, all right, well, again, what big bad are they have to go up against? And we do have a big bad here. Uh, I guess, spoiler alert, if you haven't read the previous issues, uh, it's actually Casey's mother, uh, Jessica, uh, who works for the KGB, is the big bad. So we try to really make it more personal. Uh, and yeah, so I would say there's definitely a Marvel influence. There's definitely a Spider-Man influence. I love Spider-Man. I love Spider-Girl. So there's a huge influence there. But then I always look at Invulnerable as like your classic Superman. I, I always say if Invulnerable is Superman if he was a deadbeat dad. So I think there's a combination of all different superhero genres and comics that kind of meld to make like father, like daughter. And I guess my experience of reading comics for, for as long as I have. Yeah, that's really cool. It kind of reminds me of, um, you know, I think that's what made the Incredibles so good was that it was completely grounded in like this reality of like a family, you know, and dealing with that family drama. And then uh, that's also kind of come up a lot lately. I've been reading, um, Firepower by Robert Kirkman. Oh, love it. Very good. Yes, it's so good. And I think like the main reason is because all of the family drama and like the real life issues are so well done, so well constructed. It feels organic and you relate to that. And so then they start throwing fireballs and that's like icing on the cake, you know, but that that cake is just made out of like this wholesome like family drama and things that we can all relate to, you know. So I think that's an important hook in this story is that we're going to be looking at a family. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I never noticed the Incredibles, Incredibles connection, but I've definitely gotten that before. I'm like, yeah, it is kind of like Incredibles because there is a villain, right? But it's definitely more about if you, you look at the first Incredibles, it was more about like the husband wife dynamic of like, well, mm -hmm. I don't want to be a superhero. I want to have a normal life. It's like, well, I do want to be a superhero and, and all this other crazy drama that goes along with it. So yeah, I definitely agree. You know, you try to ground it. You, I, I want everyone to read comics. You know, I, I try not to make it um, 
that oh, only if you read uh, Spider Man for twenty years, you could read this. I, I mean, yeah. I, I definitely have fun little tidbits, like little jokes I'll have in there. Like, um, I'm writing a crossover with my friend. I guess I could spoil this. Uh, he writes The Haunting, uh, and one of the lines we have is uh, from Wes, our our superhero encyclopedia, and he he referenced a fastball special. So, like those little things, like yes, a comic person's gonna know it, but I, I try not to single anything out. And even if this is your first comic, it'll, it's easily you're you're able to read it yeah yeah that's great i mean you have to have a good uh entry point for your audience you know um it, it's <clears throat> that's something that tends to hold people back whenever they come into comics is uh you know how much history there is built into some of these people these characters these different things so um it's good to see that you know you consider that whenever you're looking to find new readers and everything we are on issue seven though, right? So there's still seven. a whole six issues for everybody to get caught up on. Yeah, which is actually, it's really cool to see like what people have been backing. Uh, a lot of people have been backing the digital catch up tier and the physical catch up tier. That's actually like the highest tiers right now, which is cool. Cause like, you know, sometimes you expect people just to support the book and like, oh, I'll read up the issue seven. But a lot of people want to start from the beginning, which I'm very happy for. And I'm excited for everyone to go on the ride. Uh, and yeah, so there's an opportunity that the $25 uh, tier is to catch up on all seven issues. I give you the, the trade within the digital tier as well through one through four. So there's actually extra stories within there. So it's not just one through four and then you get five, six and seven. Uh, and then the physical, same thing. So you get the trade, you get issue five, six and seven. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the, yeah, I think trades are always best when there's a little bit extra in there, you know. Uh, makes it worth the buy, especially if you already read all the floppies, you know, so exactly. That's, uh, yeah, that's a good deal. You get caught up and you get, uh, you know, the director's cut version of it. Um, what about the artwork? I really like it. Uh, who does this and how did that come about? Yeah, so uh, the artist for the interiors is Wayne Brown. So I started this comic journey about five years ago. At that time, uh, Short Fuse Media uh, was publishing my comics. I self-published now. Um, but they helped me find the artist, Wayne Brown. And, you know, throughout, like, the first issue, we're just, like, kind of, I don't even think we really talked. I, it was really through the publisher. I, I gave my notes. I'm like, here it is. And then issue two, uh, we became Facebook friends. And, like, ever since then, uh, we chat, like, once a week, like, oh, we should do this, this, and that. So we really uh, make it a very collaborative effort. Uh, so he's the artist for the interiors. I really want to make it an old school vibe. I really, that's a cartoony, emotional um, even comedic vibe. And I think Wayne does a great job with that. And then the covers, we have so many diverse covers. So we have uh, the thumbnail is uh, Paper Cats, who's amazing. And she's so great to work with. Uh, and I think it's so um, eye popping. It shows exactly what issue seven is kind of about, which is Casey uh, having to be a hero this whole entire time. She says, Hey, this is the very reason my dad left. And uh, now she has to save her dad because you see in the second cover with uh, the the invulnerable cover, he's kind of hurt. His name's invulnerable. How did he get hurt? You got to read the other issues. But uh, Casey does have to save him. And I wanted to really showcase that in that cover. And then I had a fun lofi hip hop cover uh, anime style, which is actually the one that's doing the best uh, right now. I mean, we still have 22 days left. Uh, and, and that's um, by Alina. Uh, and yeah, I really try to make it, the covers as the, in the artwork as uh, diverse as possible and and uh, try to showcase a different side of the story. Yeah, uh, that's the one I'm looking at right here. And uh, it, it looks good. It almost looks like uh, Doctor Who in the background, but then there's like uh, kind of some anime influence in there as well. And uh, the, the main girl even reminds me of uh, my daughter. She really likes the um, the Mean Girls free comic book day issue. She likes oh, that right. one. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, it kind of has that style too. They, they have like that very flowy hair with that soft light, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's she cool. did a great job. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then you got uh, the rest of your team. Uh, what does it take you to put the book together? Where, what's the process kind of like between behind putting it all together, bringing the whole team in? So uh, first I write the script and once that's all done, um, I hand it to Wayne who does the interiors. He does the thumbnails first, which means like kind of just like a gist of what it's going to look like. So, uh, you know, the paneling and see if that looks all good. And 
uh, you know, he'll have some notes and say, Hey, you want to do this and that. And, and, you know, he was, again, since we work together a lot, we, I try and make it collaborative. And if he has some ideas, we'll, we'll throw it in. Um, actually the action, um, scene of this issue was a lot of his improv, which was kind of cool. Uh, and then after that, I hand it to my colorist. Uh, I try to finish all the pages before I hand it to my color colorist, uh, besides preview pages. So we had to get the preview pages done. But um, I try to wait until all the interiors are done, hand it to her. Um, and that's Lisa Moore. She's done stuff for Garfield. She works for her own publishing company, Last Number Press, which is actually uh, co-owned by her husband, uh, one of my really, really good friends, Bam, uh, Brant uh, Fowler, who has a Kickstarter of his own right now for Last Ember. And you definitely should go check that out as well. Uh, and then, yeah, then he letters the book and it's nice because I have a good relationship with everybody. And again, Brant's a really, really good friend of mine. Uh, Lisa's a good friend. Uh, and then Wayne, we become good friends through this. So it's, it's nice. That it kind of feels like a comic book family in a way. Uh, and I try to make it as collaborative as possible. And that's the finished product. You know, I think we, we work pretty fast for an indie book, uh, and we try to get it out there for everybody. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been putting this out? Because I mean, I've recently become aware of it probably within the last two or so. Um, so when did one start? What's your turnaround time on these? Uh, so when I was with my previous publisher, because there were so many other books we were putting out, like not me personally, but they had other books they were putting out. Um, it was a little slower. So like we would do a Kickstarter probably once a year. Now that I'm on my own, um, I've been trying to turn around for a year. So we've actually been on track to do that, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, I've been doing this for about five years. Uh, I started my own company with issue six. Uh, so issue six was June. We had that Kickstarter. And okay. once it was all in everyone's hands, um, we, we then started to put together Kickstarter for this. Um, which is, you know, the, the book's almost done the, the, the estimated time to get it to everybody's March, which looking great to, to get it done in March. I always try to make it even actually later. So maybe it'll get done earlier, but it's just like, I try to make it, maybe give yourself yeah. a little push time. So that'll probably do be done in March. And then, uh, like I mentioned before, I actually have a crossover book with my friend, um, Phil Falco, who works on haunting. And we just finished a script for that. So we're, we're hoping for a Kickstarter um, after I give the the issues for like follow like daughter. So an issue eight Kickstarter will probably be around summer. So yeah, we're really, we try to push the, the issues as quickly as possible. And I think for indie book, that's pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, some of my favorite uh, indie uh, Kickstarter creators that I follow and stuff on a regular basis, That's that seems to be pretty good. I think I've seen... Uh, after light comics, I think they did like six of them this year. Um, but it does nice seem like, that, like, yeah, I what's nice about that, they probably have some in their like pocket beforehand. Mm -hmm. They probably finished like three of them, like, here it is, now we can release them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, most uh, most of the like, I don't know how to, you know, these people that are doing a really good job with Kickstarter and maintaining, they're doing like four a year, three to four a year, and it that that's impressive, you know, because doing this all like from the ground level from scratch is it's a lot of work. I, I think that people, uh, you know, because you hear about, you see how many books that these bigger publishers are putting out, you know, and you forget when you get down to this level, there's a certain level of, uh, you know, attention that and detail that takes time that, uh, you know, you can't, to lose one book is a bigger problem at this level than it is, you know, up there, they lose a whole case of them and they can flip that over, you know, but as an indie publisher, it gets really hard. The margins get really tight. They definitely do, which is why Kickstarter helps so much. It's, it's interesting because I've gotten comments before where like, oh, I want to support the book. I'm like, cool, yeah, definitely go support the Kickstarter. And they're like, I don't want to support that. I'll, I'll, make, I'll wait until it's like in the store um, or either even on my online store. I'm like, no, no, you really should support this because this helps us the most to get funding. Like if we don't, which it does thankfully look like we're going to fund hopefully very soon um, for this one with a lot of days left. But that's not for everybody, you know, like, and mm -hmm. again, I was lucky enough and, and obviously worked hard uh, to be lucky enough to uh, get to this point. But, you know, that's the most important is to really support these Kickstarters to actually get these comics made. Because like you said, the margins are, are really thin. And with indie creators, you're doing everything, you know, like uh, as the writer here, you're the, the you're the producer, you're kind of the director, you're your own PR person, you're everything. You're taking a lot of roles and it takes a lot of time. 
uh, which is all worth it. Uh, but yeah, you you, ha you wear a lot of hats that mm -hmm. in the bigger companies, you just have to write the book. And yeah, you have to promote it, but you don't have to like go directly to an outlet and be like, can you do an interview? You have mm -hmm. a PR team to say, hey, can this person do an interview with you? Or that um, that outlet will be like, oh, I want to do an interview with this person. But as an indie creator, you got to do all that yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even uh, even I call them like small press, even though they're getting pretty big. But, you know, like your image, your boom, um, Aftershock, like they have those structures in place. You know, even if you're doing like a creator own thing at Image, like they have systems and structures in place to help you get your stuff promoted. And there's a certain level of attention that already comes with that little eye, you know, so it is like at this level, you're you're pushing everything on your own. You know, you have to build your own networks and your own channels and your own advertising into everything else you already have to do. And uh, that, that's what I love about this level of creation is because it's so like indie, so ground level, like it's truly a labor of passion, you know, and you get these creators, they're doing a little bit of everything in order to get this book out, but they're willing to do those things because it's something that, you know, they're really passionate about is something they really want to do. So um, I guess from you, what I would like to ask is like, what is the inspiration here? What really drove you to want to create like father, like daughter? Oh, man. Um, I always just like creating. I always love comics. And I, you know, I really wanted to tell my own story. I, you know, something that I felt like wasn't in the pocket of comics at that time. I still don't think it's in the pocket of comics. And I, I just love storytelling. And I love this medium. And I just want to share more of that and I, I get excited for people's reactions too right like when you're writing it yourself you're like oh man that seems fun and you want to see like how people react to that or where you think it's gonna go I think that's like kind of the best part is the feedback from mm -hmm. like your reader and, and be like oh man that was a really cool twist or like oh, I didn't see that coming oh I think this is gonna happen and you're like, oh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's kind of cool. That's where you think it's going to go. Um, so I think that's cool. Like, I think that's the most rewarding thing is like once it gets into people's hands and even this Kickstarter aspect of it all, like it's hard work. It's very hard work to do these Kickstarters, but it's so rewarding to see like how many people get really excited about the book or how many people are excited just to try out the book and really want to push your Kickstarter to do well. So uh, I think that's really cool as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that uh, really interests me. Kickstarter does a really great job of like building this ecosystem. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can build a fan base and you can really get those wheels turning, like, uh, and get that traction, you know, when you launch a Kickstarter, it lets the people know that we're already at your last Kickstarter. Um, and it helps really bring these people in. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's almost hands off, but not quite like they have their structure and everything that facilitates you as a creator, but it also gives you so much control, you know, to, to kind of build your own store and build your own audience and, um, you know, hook people in and have them keep coming back, whether they're coming back from the same series or if you're launching a new series or something like that, you know? Um, so, so what do you do to kind of like grow your, your community and your audience and try to retain them in between Kickstarters? That's a really good question. Uh, I would say that, just trying to keep them informed and and i think being consistent and really showing obviously delivering on time and like showing that you're creating the product so uh trying to trying to make that that time period of getting the book in people's hands as quickly as possible and obviously as professionally as possible and as perfect as possible um i think really shows and and most people that support kickstarters know you're not going to get this book every month you know it's not an image book like you, you might get it every quarter uh, and, and they get excited for that issue. So I think that's a big thing. It's also like trying to reach another audience. I think that's kind of the harder part. Like you're, it, the people you already have, um, if you've done your job right, you've created a good book and, and you've, you've interacted with them and, and, and made them feel part of the process, then they'll come back for the next issue. I think that the harder part is like, how do you make your audience grow? How do you get more people to read it, especially as you have more issues. Like, you know, it's obviously a lot for someone to invest $40 or $20 into your book. Um, and and I, I guess I've done my job, right? Because people are getting the physical catch up, they're getting the digital catch up. And that's like, so special to me. So I think uh, trying to reach another audience and figuring out how to get more people on Kickstarter, how people could get more eyes on your book, like, how to utilize social media, how to utilize advertising, how to utilize your PR. It's all part of 
this you know yeah. i think a lot of people think it's just the writing and it's like no it's it's so much more than that you you have to learn how to market yourself and market you as a creator but your own book mm -hmm. and and try to get in as many people's hands as possible and I, you know I, i'm still learning that anyone's still learning that i i think if you ever say you're an expert and you don't need to learn <laughs> anymore then you're you're probably not an expert yeah when you're, you have to learn and you you got to continue to grow and i think kickstarter mm -hmm. has many possibilities for that mm -hmm. yeah i agree um that, that's really interesting, though, like you're looking at uh, trying to grow your audience and find those new eyeballs. Um, I think it's kind of interesting. Do you know who uh, Magdalene Holly Rising is? I, I believe don't. that's her name. What, what do she, they do? Uh, well, she writes comics. Uh, she does ki like Kickstarter style uh, stuff, kind of like you're doing here. Um, mm -hmm. she does Boston metaphysical society. That's kind of her big brand. And she's like really built that out over the years. Um, but I was listening to her on a podcast and she said something that struck me like so true, you know, and basically she had went to film school. She was trying to like write and break into the film industry and it just wasn't working, you know? And somebody told her, they're like, you know, you could probably really get some attention and like get wheels turning if you went into comics. And she was like, well, I don't like superheroes. And they said, no, no, look. And they gave her uh, like an indie comic, you know, and it just completely opened her mind. Suddenly she realized like there's this whole side, you know, and I always feel like it's unfortunate that superheroes are kind of the face of the industry right now, you know, because if you like superheroes, you probably already read superhero comics or you're watching the movies and coming over and hoping for the same thing. But there's this whole audience that's fallen in love with the exact types of things that indie comics are doing right now you know those things on tv those like stranger things you know like people that fall in love with that content is um the same people that would love like image and boom books and stuff you know so i guess sure. what i'm kind of looking for here is like how do you see reaching out and finding a new audience beyond people like you know sure it's great if they're already reading comics they're more likely to come how can you reach people outside of comics that aren't really already into comics? That's such a good question. I think like the industry is looking for it as well. And I loved your first part of that too, is because uh, I actually went into, I have a master's in TV writing. Now, obviously I was already into comics. I've been reading comics all my life and I wanted to write comics, but I, you know, I see a lot of people trying to break into TV. It's hard. I've tried, I tr I'm trying to break into TV as well, but a lot of advice I've gotten from TV writers who know my background is like, keep writing comics. Um, if you keep writing comics, you're going to be able to sell your IP and get into a TV, a TV writing room in some regard. So if you write comics, it actually opens up to those other fields and you could sell your IP depending on, you know, how well you do. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, comics is actually a great starting point and it's cheaper, you know, it's cheaper mm -hmm. to make. I mean, it's obviously expensive still. You could mm -hmm. like my goal is $5,000 and I'll be spending $5,000 to get everything printed and get everything colored, you know, so, and to get everything done. So uh, yes, it's still expensive, but it's, it's cheaper than making a feature like film. And it's, it's, I think your time is used wisely and because you have to make a lot of spec scripts for TV. So you have to make like, you know, a lot. Yeah, you, know, you have to keep on writing and, and you don't know if it's going to be everyone's favorite. And you're like, oh, what am I doing about that story now? At least with a comic, you're selling it and you're also kind of using it as your spec script. I mean, you you have to show that you write TV as well. So write mm -hmm. your spec scripts. But like, it's a good opportunity for see people to see your writing, but also kind of be able to utilize it and like make mm -hmm. it your business and be able to sell it. Anyways, going back to your other question, how do you get those people to go into comics and not believe that just superheroes? Um, I think it's not as much on the indie side. Uh, there are ways for the indie side to do it, but in the Marvel and DC side, I do think they they do need to bring that superhero crowd into comics. Like the, you know, there's so many people that watch these superhero superhero mm -hmm. movies that are not reading comics, so they have to do that first. In the indie side, I think it's using other platforms. So one great platform, and I, I've been mentioning this a lot, is Webtoons and Tapas. They have millions of people viewing their comics much more than people reading comics that go to the comic book store and buy it yeah. online. So utilize Webtoons. I see actually a lot of um, mainstream creators. Uh, I just saw Justin Jordan. He had 
uh, uh, webtoons that he's collecting now through Kickstarter. So you can actually see the marriage between Kickstarter and web comics and webtoons. There's a really great fan base there. So I think mar the really trying to marry the physical with the digital aspect of webtoons or web comics can really bring in a whole different audience to comics. And I think Kickstarter is actually that bridge. And I hope it continues to be that bridge and they utilize that. So yeah, I think there's this cool marriage that definitely mm -hmm. can happen. Yeah, I really like uh, webtoons. Like whenever people are doing a webtoon and they take uh, advantage of that specific scrolling medium, mm -hmm. it's incredible. Like it, it's one of the most immersive reading experiences, especially for like digital comics. It, it's so good. Um, and they have a really great structure within their, within their organization to help find those creators and bring them from the free side into the paid side and stuff. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, as somebody who's like, I'm not like hardcore into anime and manga and stuff, um, but familiar with it. And I read it with my kids and stuff a lot. Um, that's my one issue with webtoons is almost everything I find on there is um, kind of like anime derivative, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. And whenever I do come across something that's more like comic book style or has an, a more, a more American style to the artwork and the storytelling, um, those ones really grab me. There's one right now, um, after the gold rush, I think it's a Kickstarter project and he's kind of been like transferring it over to webtoons slowly, but surely. And, um, it's really cool, you know, and that's really got me back into webtoons because I was getting into it, but then it felt like everything new I was finding was kind of like anime derivative, you know, and, uh, too much of that stuff is not my favorite thing. So that is my one thing with webtoons. I really like the platform and what they're doing. I just hope to see it kind of start to diversify as it gets bigger and bigger now, you know? I agree. I think that bridge goes to the other side as well. If they could get these mainstream Scott Snyders or whoever to webtoons and tapas, I think it would really help bring a dive. I think it helps both mediums um, for sure. I get why webtoons wants to do the anime ish because they're looking for a younger audience and that's actually mm -hmm. why they're doing well is because they actually aim to a younger audience where comics don't sadly like we have some of the young adult comics but i think it actually is hard for kids to get into comics and i think there needs to be a better way to do so uh i think a lot of people like me or or, or a lot of people are just like oh my dad got me into it like oh someone in my family got it got me into it but it needs to be easier than that uh for yeah. kids to get in the comics yeah. Yeah. I always, you know, Marvel and DC, they're constantly making these efforts, you know, and um, I don't know. I just feel like they don't put as much thought and advertising and real true pushes behind a lot of those initiatives, you know? Um, and, and I wish they would because like I have two kids and they suffer with uh, from dyslexia. And so one way that I've really gotten them to like kind of start get better at reading and practicing and wanting to read a lot is through comics, except for it almost seems like comics has become this gateway to uh, manga now for them. Yeah, which is interesting. And again, maybe because it goes back to like webtoons targeting kids. I think the better the best way for Marvel and DC to do that, and I do believe they should still do their young adult line. But to really market their Miss Marvels, their Miles Moraleses, their Batgirls or whatever, not to a younger audience, but somehow try to reach them. Because I think these books are, it is like Disney, right? Like a 50-year-old can really enjoy Zootopia and a five-year-old can really enjoy Zootopia. Why not make that transition into comics? Like, why can't they all enjoy Miss Marvel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Like I'll get them uh, like the free comic book day issues or I'll grab like uh, a couple of issues of like my little pony or something that really interests them and they'll be really into it. But if I take them to the store with me and offer to buy them, whatever they pick straight to the manga every time, every oh, time. Interesting. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know why that appeals to them so much. I kind of get it in the teenage years because um, the anime tradition is kind of like to express every emotion at 100 as pure as possible, you know, and I think in those teenage years, raging hormones and everything else, I think that's very relatable. But even my eight year old, like she just buys into the manga so quick and I don't know what appeals to them so much about it. it not that there's a problem with it. It's just something I observe and I wonder like what can American comic books learn from that, you know? I think American comics like 
kind of takes into the 80s stuff, which is great. They like, you know, it's very intense paneling and everything's very thoughtful. And I think not that manga is not thoughtful, but I feel like there's less paneling and it's definitely more about the characters and less about like, still about the artwork, but it's like the paneling is not part of the artwork. It's more about like, it's just kind of telling the story. Mm -hmm. and maybe American comics to take that. I don't know, because I wouldn't want to take away what we have from American comics. But yeah, I think maybe that's why for manga, it's like bigger pictures and not as much paneling. Also, yeah. like, the dimensions are different too. It's a little smaller. They're not like mm -hmm. a floppy. There's more usually to read. So yeah, it's it's interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a, a strange phenomenon I've noticed and always wonder, you know, like how do we reach all these other people like that? Um, so I, that's most of uh, what I have for you right now. Um, other than that, I mean, let the people know what they need to do and where they can find you again. Of course. Well, thank you again for having me. This is a lot of fun. I just love talking industry stuff in general and it was a blast talking about it. Uh, but yeah, you can follow me at Kamigono, uh most places. I do a weekly YouTube show where I talk about all the comics I read. I try to be pretty diverse with those comics, Marvel, DC, Indies. Uh, and then uh, the Kickstarter, like Follow My Daughter. We have like, I think 22 days left right now. And I, I mean, hopefully when this is posted, it will be funded. But we're like $150 away from being funded. We're at like 190 backers uh, and we... We have uh, backer tiers for every like 50 backers we get. So you get a lot of indie comics for free, like big indie comics as well from like Action Lab and a lot of indie kits. So even if you support this book for a dollar, you're getting maybe at the end of this project about 20 free books, which is crazy. So we're just talking about like, how do I get in the comics? Like there is such a diverse palette of comics in this indie bundle that these, these creators are generous enough to give. Back it up for a dollar and you get all these comics. I just want to point out for that one dollar, Banjax is really good. Ichabod Jones is incredible. Uh, Mis Miskatonic High is pretty good. And uh, Spencer and Locke is incredible. So, and, and that's only, I think, four out of what, like seven books there? Yeah, there's More eight than there, that. and then eight. we unlocked two of them already for the backer uh, the backer stretch goals. We have three more of that, and hint, hint, the first stretch goal is an indie bundle uh, expansion pack, and it's eight more comics. Wow. We're getting like 20 comics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I mean, that's four right off the top of my head that I know are good books, so well worth the dollar. Go check out the Kickstarter and, uh, you know, give her a little bit of your money, and I'm sure she's going to deliver on the value for you. Thank you. And yeah, this is so great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem.